Yoni's disease, a chronic bacterial enteritis of cattle in which the histological characters and naked eye appearances are as similar as may be to those we have found in man. But the histological characters are so similar as to justify a position that the diseases may be the same. Sir T. Kennedy Dalziel, 1913. I've always loved being active and healthy, and still do today, but for a period of my life, that all ended. In late 2009, at age 31, I was diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a chronic and lifelong inflammatory condition of the gastrointestinal tract. There is no cure. Estimates of disease rates vary, but the disease is most prevalent in the developed world, and rates are increasing. Within four months of the first symptoms, I was very, very sick. This was me. I lost about 25 kilos or 55 pounds, and at my worst, weighed around 57 kilos or 125 pounds. I'm 6 foot 2, so I was very underweight. I was running to the toilet 18 to 20 times a day with diarrhea. I had no control over urgency, and each time the toilet bowl was covered in blood. A colonoscopy and various other tests showed I had inflammation right through both small and large intestines. As is common with the disease, I also had additional symptoms, including abdominal pain, weakness and exhaustion, nausea, and I just generally felt sick. I became housebound and lost my job. I had no social life, and as one of the many side effects of prednisone, a steroid that I was put on, I was also losing about 12% of my bone density each year. That was my condition for the next two years through 2010 and 2011. During that time, every gastroenterologist who examined me described me as a severe case, but also said it wasn't the worst bowel they'd seen. As I went from doctor to doctor, I was put on all the standard and latest treatments one after the other, including the immune system modifying drugs Remicade and Humira, but each time I didn't respond. And that's not unusual. The best drugs available for this disease typically demonstrate remission rates of around 30 and 40%, and relapses are common. Surgery and the removal of my large intestine was suggested as a possible option for me. I also did my own research on the internet and tried every treatment I could find. I eliminated foods, tried all sorts of diets, and even hookworms. If someone out there said it worked for them, then I tried it. I searched the US National Library of Medicine database via the PubMed website looking for information about clinical trials, and I also watched the latest health reports. I'm now 35, I'm well, I can eat whatever I like, I'm back to a healthy weight, and I do still have some symptoms, but I'm a world away from where I was, and I've been told I should remain well going forward. It's all because of two gastroenterologists who I discovered through my own research, Professor John Herman Taylor and Professor Thomas Barodi. They believe they know the cause of Crohn's disease and how to treat it. For the past 20 years, they've been at odds with the rest of the medical establishment. While most gastroenterologists believe Crohn's to be an autoimmune disease, or possibly an inflammatory response to abnormal gut ecology, a so-called dysbiosis, Professor Herman Taylor and Professor Barodi think that a single germ, a pathogen, causes the majority of cases of Crohn's disease. Thus it can be treated not as an immune dysfunction, but as an infection. There is a rapidly growing body of scientific evidence published in peer-reviewed scientific journals which suggests that human infection with the mycobacterium known as Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, MAP, may be causing some and possibly all cases of Crohn's disease. Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, commonly known as MAP, is a proven cause of chronic inflammation of the intestinal tract in a range of animal species, including food-producing animals and several non-human primates. MAP infection in animals is called Yoni's disease. It's an animal health issue in many countries, costing the dairy and livestock industry millions of dollars annually in decreased milk production and decreased slaughter value. And you can read about this on the Yoni's Information Centre website, yonis.org. A study published in 2007 by the National Animal Health Monitoring System in the United States, for example, found that 68.1% of dairy herds in that country were infected. In other words, 68.1% of dairy herds had at least one animal test positive to MAP. About 80% of US dairy operations participated in the study. Similarly, according to Dairy New Zealand's website, Yoni's disease is a bacterial clinical disease that has been reported from 20% of dairy herds over a three-year period, probably with up to 60% of animals infected. Animals typically don't show symptoms of disease until years after infection, and, like in Crohn's disease, often in early adulthood. The causal link between MAP and Yoni's disease is undisputed. Yoni's prevention or eradication programs are growing worldwide. 
Some are based on vaccination, others on culling infected animals, others on education or sequestering newborn calves. There is also a suggestion that these bacteria play a causal role in Crohn's disease, but there is currently no proven link between the two, and the consensus amongst the scientific and medical community is that there is no link. Crohn's disease and Yoni's disease have similarities, including some pathological ones, but they also have differences. The biggest difference is that it's easy to see map under a microscope in biopsy specimens in animals, or to test animals for infection by DNA detection methods or culture. In humans, there's no gold standard to determine if a person has a MAP infection or not. Many studies, for example, have shown a far higher rate of MAP infection in patients with Crohn's disease than is found in the general population, suggesting a possible link. But there have also been studies that have shown no correlation. Attempts over the years to treat Crohn's disease with various combinations of antimycobacterial antibiotics have had variable success. This open-label study from 1997 showed a high success rate, but lacks the credibility of a properly designed, blind, placebo-controlled study. The bacteria are very difficult to treat, and in humans, very difficult to detect. The debate has been around for many years, but has recently undergone resurgence. The main source or sources of human exposure to the bacteria are unclear, but it has been found in milk. MAP is known to be highly heat-resistant, and in three separate studies, in the United States, the United Kingdom, and in Europe, Viable MAP was successfully cultured from a small percentage of retail pasteurised milk, but whether these are at levels high enough to potentially cause disease in humans is still not known. In 2000, a comprehensive report by the European Commission into possible links between MAP and Crohn's disease was published. It referenced 372 scientific papers and articles and had the following two main findings. The currently available evidence is insufficient to confirm or disprove that Mycobacterium paratuberculosis is a causative agent of at least some cases of Crohn's disease in man. There are sufficient grounds for concern to warrant increased and urgent research activity to resolve the issue. A 2008 report by the American Academy of Microbiology had similar findings. One thing is clear. There's often resistance from the medical establishment to unconventional theories. Physicians demand proof before making a paradigm shift in the way any disease is understood and treated. And this is not the first time in history that an elusive bacterial cause was dismissed by mainstream medicine only to be accepted years later. Until the early 1980s, peptic ulcers were thought to be caused by acid and stress but were later found to be caused by bacterial infection. In a desperate attempt to prove this, Australian scientist Dr Barry Marshall even infected himself with the bacteria. He and Dr. Robin Warren later won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the bacterium Helicobacter pylori and its role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. But here's the most important part. It was Professor Thomas Barodi who became the first physician credited with formulating and patenting the triple therapy that would later become the gold standard for treating peptic ulcer disease. That was in 1985, but it wasn't until the early 1990s and only after years of demonstrating a successful therapy that both the therapy and then the theory on causality began to be adopted by the rest of the medical establishment. So Professor Barodi has done this before. Both leprosy and tuberculosis are human mycobacterial infections. By combining treatment for leprosy and multidrug resistant TB, Professor Barodi came up with his protocol for Crohn's disease. It is now patented. At his private clinic in Sydney, he has been successfully treating around 300 patients since 1996. During that time, the dosing and composition of the therapy has been improved. It has achieved remarkable and dramatic reversal of inflammation, together with long-term remission of symptoms in many patients. So if he's really been successfully treating sick patients like me since 1996, almost 20 years, then surely people would know about it and there should have been a clinical trial to demonstrate whether or not the treatment really works. There was a clinical trial. It was a two-year study, the results of which were published in 2007, it was touted as a landmark study, was Australia-wide, involved over 200 patients, and was privately funded by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals Australia. The trial was run by another Sydney-based gastroenterologist and had the following finding. We did not find evidence of a sustained benefit. This finding does not support a significant role for Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis in the pathogenesis of Crohn's disease in the majority of patients. That's exactly what I was told and am still being told by gastroenterologists. What I wasn't told was that this trial received a notable amount of scientific criticism for a number of alleged design flaws, and it still demonstrated one of the highest remission rates to date. 
The treatment of other non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections such as Mycobacterium avium complex typically requires higher doses of clarithromycin, rifibutin and clofazamine than were used in this trial. The study design required an unrealistically high response rate for a positive outcome. Most of the current Crohn's therapies including infliximab would probably fail to show a positive outcome by this measure. The authors' conclusions are not supported by their work. Although the paper by Selby et al. appears legitimate in its empirical reporting, its conclusions go far beyond its data. Although both large sample size and placebo controls are always desirable, they cannot compensate for an inadequate treatment regime. One can hardly expect to test a possible medicine by giving it in insufficient quantities but to large numbers of patients. Thus the Selby et al. research has not only failed to demonstrate a relevance of antimycobacterial therapy in the treatment of Crohn's disease, it may also have been bad clinical medicine. At four months, 66% of patients on antimap therapy were in complete clinical remission. This response rate is better than any other therapy, including infliximab, to date. The data support another interpretation. Antimap therapy provides a more effective treatment regimen with a more favourable side effect profile than current conventional therapy. Clinical responses not achieving complete remission were considered to be failures. The subset of patients for whom antimap therapy is a miracle therapy is completely unreported. The authors dismiss antimap therapy because it does not cure the disease, although it is safer and does a better job at achieving remission. The authors report the data accurately, but their interpretations need to be challenged. Perhaps if the authors were to re-evaluate their conclusions, they would realise the true value of their efforts. According to the recommended dosing for Mycobacterium avium infection, rifibutin was underdosed by greater than 30%, clarithromycin by approximately 50%, and clofazamine by greater than 50%. And then, in the crucial part of the trial, as admitted by the authors, clofazamine did not dissolve properly. This raises the serious question of the trial's validity beyond 16 weeks when the issue with clofazamine bioavailability commenced. We as physicians currently treating patients with Crohn's disease using anti-MAP drugs and seeing results not achievable with established therapies are surprised that this gastroenterology paper describing an effective new breakthrough therapy with a high remission rate was cast in a negative light. The results of which have shown that the highest reported remission can be achieved with anti-MAP therapy. Unfortunately, the trial used subtherapeutic doses failed to test patients before they were treated for MAP presence and did not replace patients who were given non-dissolving clofazamine drugs so that the long-term maintenance part of the trial cannot be currently accepted as having any clinical significance. Another trial began in late 2013. This one is worldwide, involving some 600 patients from North America and multiple countries across Europe. Professor Barodi still owns the patent, but the treatment has been licensed out to the Israeli pharmaceutical company Red Hill Biopharma, and they will be funding the pivotal trials. Antimab therapy for me has been a miracle treatment. It probably saved my life. Every time I go to the clinic, I get the same story from patients. They'd been sick for years, no one could help them, and they've now been given their lives back. The treatment doesn't work for everyone, and there's always a risk of side effects. For me, the side effects have been very minor. Most patients have no idea this treatment's available. There are only three doctors in the world I know of who are familiar with and provide anti-MAP therapy. In the UK, Dr. Jeremy Sanderson. Located at King's College London, he is a colleague of Professor John Herman Taylor's. Local patients can see him on the National Health Service and international patients can see him privately at London Bridge Hospital. In Australia, the Centre for Digestive Diseases treats both local and international patients and you can see any of the gastroenterologists at the centre. Local patients should get any Medicare benefits. In the United States, Dr. William Chamberlain, who is now at Mountain View Regional Medical Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico, treats both local and international patients. You don't have to travel to see these doctors. If patients can find a local gastroenterologist or general practitioner who is prepared to consider prescribing anti-MAP therapy, any of these doctors will then show your doctor what to do. It's important you have a doctor who can monitor you. One of the antibiotics used in the treatment, clofazamine, is currently a first-line treatment for leprosy in developing countries. In 2004, production of the drug ceased in the United States and Canada due to it not being profitable. It's what's known as an orphan drug, and you may want to check the availability of it in your country. If you're unable to obtain it, it's currently available on medical prescription from Victoria Pharmacy Zurich, also known as Pharma World, a large and reputable international pharmacy located in Zurich, Switzerland. Before seeking treatment, Please check Dr. Judith Lipton's website. Antimap therapy has been a successful treatment for her and she has now been off all medications for several years. This nine-part YouTube video is an interview with Professor Thomas Barodi in which he discusses antimap therapy and patient experiences. 
Beginning in 1997, Professor John Herman Taylor, then at St George's University of London, led the team which has made an anti-MAP vaccine for the prevention and treatment of Crohn's disease. It has now shown promising results against MAP infection in cattle and is ready for clinical trials against MAP infection in people. In 2008, Professor Herman Taylor moved to King's College London where he has developed a new and much needed clinical diagnostic, a test for MAP, which will partner the vaccine treatment. The test still requires a final year funding to bring it to completion. Crohn's disease devastates lives, even if only a fraction of cases are caused by MAP. Serious action needs to be taken to limit human exposure and to get these bacteria out of the food chain. When preventing public health threats, governments and regulatory bodies typically don't and shouldn't demand 100% confidence in order to take precautionary measures. So far, engagement from both has been minimal.